Today on the Matt Wall Show, the baby killers are in a state of full-on panic as the Supreme Court reportedly prepares to overturn Roe, abolishing the constitutional right to abortion, which was always fictional and never really existed anyway. Uh, I have a lot to say about this, as you can imagine. Also, an MSNBC analyst warns that Nazis will take over because Elon Musk owns Twitter. Jen Psaki makes the lamest attempt yet to justify the Biden administration's new Ministry of Truth. The ruling class once again celebrates itself at the Met Gala. And in our daily cancellation, we'll discuss the story of a woman who left her husband after she met her true, quote, soulmate. Not a great decision, as it turns out. We'll talk about all that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. You know, interest rates are continuing to fluctuate. They're very volatile. I really can't stress this enough. It's important to get ahead of them and look into a mortgage refinance while you can. Or better yet, you should pay off high interest debt while you still can. I mean it. You still have time to save up to $1,000 a month. You just have to call American Financing, America's home loan for a home for home loans, I should say, where you'll get a free mortgage review from a salary-based consultant. There's no pressure, there's no obligation, no upfront or hidden fees. Just a simple conversation around custom loans that may fit your budget better from flexible terms to accessing cash and even debt consolidation. It really could mean up to $1,000 in monthly savings, plus tens of thousands long-term. And if you start soon, you could close in as fast as 10 days. So this means that it's uh, it's a quick close, it's very easy, you're saving money, and that's something we could all use more of, I think, uh, these days. So it's really as simple as that. And if you want to go to American Financing, all you have to do is call 866-569-4711. That's 866-569-4711. Or visit AmericanFinancing.net, NMLS 182334, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. Roe v. Wade is not yet officially overturned, but it would appear that it's on its last legs. After killing so many innocent lives, Roe itself is now a a dead man walking, condemned, in its case, justly. The earth-shattering news came last night in a leaked draft of the 5-4 to majority opinion written by Justice Samuel Alito. Roe is totally eviscerated and repudiated. Um, The subsequent 1992 decision, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which rests on the foundation of Roe, would also be overturned. Now, the Politico report, which first published the leaked draft, calls it a full-throated, unflinching repudiation of the very idea that the Constitution guarantees abortion rights, which is exactly what it is. Alito writes that, um, quote, it's time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives. The Constitution does not prohibit the citizens of each state from regulating or prohibiting abortion. Roe and Casey uh, arrogated that authority. We now overrule this decision and return that authority to the people and their elected representatives. The full text of the opinion, which runs some 98 pages, is available to be read, and it should be read, because it's almost certainly authentic, and it totally rips to shreds the legal justifications and arguments for Roe, such as they are, though really it doesn't take 98 pages to accomplish that task. You only need about a paragraph, because there is no legal reasoning behind Roe. All you have to do is dig one inch below the surface, and you'll find that the entire precipice of abortion rights, quote-unquote, is grounded in nothing. It has no roots. It would be a compliment to call it flimsy. At least flimsy things exist, but the constitutional right to abortion does not exist. The activist judges who invented the right attached it to the constitutional right to privacy, which also does not exist in the Constitution. There are then at least two degrees of separation between abortion rights and the actual text of the Constitution. That's how utterly baseless the decision was, and it's why it deserves to be overturned. It is the worst Supreme Court decision in history. There are others that come close. This is the worst. But uh, Roe is not yet overturned. Not yet, anyway. That won't happen until the decision is officially announced. And that brings us to the other major aspect of this story, the fact that it was leaked in the first place. The whole point of leaking it, it, which is an unprecedented move, nothing like this has ever happened before in American history, The whole point, of course, is to pressure one of the justices and the majority to switch sides. The other reason behind the leak is to push Democrats in Congress to pass a bill heading the Supreme Court off at the pass and codifying abortion rights into law nationwide. Within minutes of the Politico piece being published, the Democrat Party had its messaging out, and it was calling for exactly that. Just a few examples. Bernie Sanders tweeted, Congress must pass legislation that codifies Roe v. Wade as the law of the land in this country now. And if there aren't 60 votes in the Senate to do it, and there are not, we must end the filibuster to pass it with 50 votes. Elizabeth Warren said, an extremist Supreme Court is poised to overturn Roe v. Wade and impose its far-right unpopular views on the entire country. It's time for the millions who support the Constitution and abortion rights to stand up and make their voices heard. We're not going back. Not ever. 
Ayanna, Bres Ayanna Presley said, abortion care is a fundamental human right, and we must legislate like it. AOC said, people elected uh, Democrats precisely so we could lead in perilous moments like this. To codify Roe, hold corruption accountable, and have a president who uses his legal authority to break through congressional gridlock on items from student debt to climate. It's high time we do it. And then Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer issued a joint statement calling the reported decision an abomination and one of the worst and most damaging decisions in modern history. Meanwhile, the fundraising emails have already gone out. So the Democrats were ready for this, which makes it look all the more like the leak was coordinated at the highest levels of the party. All the evidence is pointing in that direction. And that brings us to, I think, a few points that um, need to be made here. First, leaking the full draft of a Supreme Court decision in order to intimidate justices into, into switching sides, potentially putting their lives in jeopardy in the process. And that's part of the point of leaking it. And also to galvanize political support for your own side. Um, all of that is much more of an assault on our institutions and our democracy than anything that happened on January 6th. May 2nd, okay, is the day the draft was published. That's yesterday. That should be the date that lives in infamy. That's what we should be talking about. May 2nd. Where were you on May 2nd? Because that's um, an actual insurrection. In effect, it's an attempt to completely upend and delegitimize the rule of law, incite violence and chaos, and potentially plunge the nation into civil war. That's the whole intention behind it. January 6th was a stroll in the park compared to this. It's not even close. Leftists are cheering whoever leaked this and will make that person into a hero whenever their identity is unveiled. Because when it comes down to it, of course, they couldn't care less about saving democracy or protecting our institutions. They'll tear the whole thing down if it benefits them. They won't even hesitate. Second point, speaking of democracy, if Roe is overturned, um, it will not have the effect of abolishing abortion nationwide. You know, the left likes to cite, and they're doing this a lot this morning, talking about um, the, the polling data from Gallup and other uh, places, which shows allegedly that 70% of Americans oppose overturning Roe. But that's only because most Americans don't understand what Roe is and what overturning it actually means. And that's because they're being lied to on this point. All that will happen now is the decision reverts back to the states, which means that most of the leftists hysterically hyperventilating right now actually won't be affected at all by this. Their states will still have abortion. In fact, a lot of these states, like in California and New York and others, they'll probably have more abortions now. They're going to change the law to make it even more um, accepting of abortion. If it's possible to make, you know, in a lot of these cases, they already have abortion up till birth. So how could you make the law more radical? Well, they're going to try. Post-birth abortions on the horizon? Potentially. But just think about this. The people who claim to cherish democracy are now panicking because voters will get to decide on abortion. They cherish democracy, and they're panicked because voters are going to decide on abortion. Allowing voters to decide the issue is now itself an attack on democracy according to the democracy advocates in the Democratic Party. Now, I should say that in, in my case, um, I don't claim that democracy is my highest value or priority. That's what they say. I think there are things higher and more important than that, which is why overturning Roe is a great and necessary first step and something to, uh, to certainly celebrate. But it's only a first step as far as I'm concerned. The next step is to abolish abortion and criminalize it nationwide. The next step is to essentially do what idiot leftists think is already happening. They think that overturning Roe v. Wade means that abortion is abolished nationwide. That's not what it means. But um, that's what they're worried about, and that's actually what we should try to do. As always with the left, I take a, um, you know, I'll give you something to cry about approach with the left. You're going to cry about it, then, you know, I'll give you something to cry about. Let's go ahead and criminalize it nationwide. And that is the next fight, and Republicans have to lean into it. Because the die is cast. The greatest cultural battle of our lives doesn't end now. It begins. Democrats are going to do everything in their power, and everything not in their power, 
to usurp the Supreme Court decision and ensure that babies continue to die at the same rate or at a higher rate than before. Um, Republicans must respond not by declaring victory and then just washing their hands of the issue, uh, not by hiding from it, but by pushing back in the other direction. They, the Democrats, want to codify abortion nationwide. We have to push to criminalize it. There's no escaping the fight now. You're either with us or against us on this. And that goes for every elected Republican. Third point, bringing this all together. Um, as I have warned for years, the left in America is nothing less and nothing more than a death cult. They fear death, certainly, fear it for themselves anyway, as evidenced by their hysteria over COVID. But paradoxically, they worship destruction. They hate what is good and beautiful. They hate innocence, most especially. They wish to destroy it all. That's why they spend so much of their demonic energy preying upon children. They consider it their right to corrupt, abuse, mutilate, drug, castrate, and sexualize children outside of the womb. Inside the womb, they believe it's their sacred right to butcher and dismember the most precious and vulnerable of God's creation. They believe that this is literally sacred. As the uh, Democrat lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania put it last night, he tweeted, let's be clear, the right to an abortion is sacred. Democrats have to act quickly, get rid of the filibuster to pass the Women's Health Protection Act, and finally codify Roe into law. We cannot afford to wait. Sacred, he says. And he means it. They all mean it. Why is abortion sacred to them? Uh, why is it their highest sacrament? Why does it attract the most religious zeal from the death worshipers? Because abortion is the ultimate middle finger to objective morality, to truth, to nature, to the family, to God, to everything they despise. Through abortion, a woman declares that she lives for herself and for herself alone. She sacrifices her child, her family, um, her femininity, everything on the altar of her own ego, the altar of the self. She fully initiates herself into the cult of self-worship. Abortion is, in many ways, like Satan's parody of baptism. The woman baptizes herself in the blood of her own child and becomes a fully liberated, fully realized, independent person. I mean, that's the dogma anyway. That's the faith-based claim. Of course, in reality, through abortion, the, the woman destroys herself, consigns herself to despair and loneliness and grief. But they don't tell her that. They make very different promises. And they cannot let abortion go without surrendering their entire worldview. Abortion is the foundation of everything they've built. Or I should say, it's the foundation of everything they've torn down. Because they don't build, they just tear things down. It lies at the center of everything for them. And so they'll fight like rabid dogs to protect it. They will do anything. I mean, literally anything. Lie, cheat, steal, kill. Anything. So be it. This is a fight worth having no matter the cost. And I'm telling you right now, it's about to get very, very ugly. So buckle up and get ready. Now let's get to our five headlines. Well, it's finally happened. The Fed is realizing the dire straits our economy is in thanks to our loose monetary policy. Apparently, you can't just spend trillions every year with no repercussions. Turns out, I mean, who, who, who would have thought aside from any rational person. Now to play catch up, the Fed has been raising rates and plans to plans uh, to raise them seven times this year alone. You're already starting to see those ripple effects in the housing market as people's buying power diminishes. If you consider what could happen in the stock market if our economy stalls out, don't wait till that happens. Take some of your profits from the stock market now and solidify them with gold from Birch Gold. Throughout history, gold has maintained its value better than any other investment in the world. Text Walsh to 989898 for a free zero-obligation info kit on holding gold in a tax-sheltered retirement account. Join the thousands of happy Birch Gold customers with countless five-star reviews and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. I trust the professionals at Birch Gold. You should, too. Text Walsh to 989898 and secure the gains you've made while you can. You know, on a lighter note, before I get back into the heavy stuff, I forgot to, uh, yesterday I forgot to give a shout out to the um, Sweet Baby Gang member who represented the gang at my kid's first communion on Saturday. Um, 
and it was it was uh, it was after mass for the record, but uh, somebody shouted "Sweet Baby Gang," you know, as we were walking to like the reception, and um, and I appreciated that. There's never an inappropriate time to rep the gang. Now, my wife, I should tell you, doesn't really agree with me on this point, but I think there's never an inappropriate time. I mean, if you see me graveside at a funeral ceremony, there would be nothing wrong with shouting sweet baby gang. If, if I'm in the hospital dying of some horrific illness and you happen to be walking by in the hallway and you see me in there, nothing wrong with poking your head in and saying sweet baby gang. In fact, I would really appreciate it. That's the last thing I heard before I died. So, um, another shout out to the uh, member of the Sweet Baby, the loyal member of the Sweet Baby Gang at the First Communion. Okay, more on the top story of the day and of the of the century, really. First of all, I got to play this because Libs of TikTok is, uh, as always, Johnny on the spot with the compilation of leftists melting down over um, the draft decision and the, the possibility that Roe v. Wade will be overturned. And there's going to be a lot more where this came from. But here's just the, the first round, and it's quite enjoyable, so let's watch. This abortion law goes beyond a woman's issue, and it goes beyond anything you can ever imagine. The societal implications of this are going to be insane. The amount of uh, just pain and damage this is going to cause and the full ability to tell a woman what she can and can't do with her body and we're going back into a handmaid's tale society here all of you women who sat home all you young girls adults over 18 years old who did not go out and vote who did not think that you need to protect your womb we're now back in the dark ages. Um, brace yourselves, ladies. I'm with you. My heart is just broken. I don't understand why this country hates women so much. I just don't understand it. We'll get through this. We'll figure out a way. No more joking about it being a handmaid's tale, it will be. You know, a couple of things there. Um, first of all, there really is something, I think, and you can't judge a book by its cover all, all the time, but I think there is something about the ugliness of leftism that seems to manifest itself in a physical way as well. You know, if you buy into the, the leftist death cult, you become a very ugly person on the inside. And, and it's just interesting that so often that tends to reflect um, on the outside as well, which, which you see so often. And we saw, we saw there. Um, and, of course, a couple other takeaways is that these people have only read one book, Handmaid's Tale, which I'm not even sure that they've read that book. They've probably just seen the show and maybe they haven't even seen the show. They're just aware of it. And so that's the only, it's, it used to be Harry Potter, but we got to get rid of Harry Potter because uh, J.K. Rowling is transphobic, apparently. And so now it's Handmaid's Tale. And speaking of transphobia, I have to say that I am totally shocked and scandalized by the transphobia on display from the left since last night. Do you notice how all, I mean, I don't know what happened, but, but uh, all of a sudden, at least for this news cycle, women are female again. Because we keep hearing how this is an attack on women. And it's like these people don't realize that uh, men can get pregnant. Or at least I thought they could. That's why, isn't that what you've been telling us? So you'll just see how, just for the news cycle, just for this issue, not even just the news cycle, but for this particular issue right now, um, women are defined biologically because that's what they need right now. And then you move on to the next topic and they don't need that anymore. So they'll throw that to the side. This is the, this is the um, advantage of being a relativist though, that you can invent whatever truth you need, whatever truth you want in whatever situation. And so for this, this is an attack on, on women's rights. 
even though, and, and the other thing we keep hearing now is that, um, you know, this men, men are legislating women's bodies. And putting aside how, again, the fact that that statement contradicts everything they say about sex and gender, but also, actually, it was seven white men. It was seven old white men who decided Roe. And now it's looking like that decision is going to be overturned by a group that includes a woman and a black man. So diversity is our strength. This is a win. This, this, this is a win for diversity. In fact, it's one of the only wins for diversity that we've seen in quite some time. Um, meanwhile, over on cable news, they've brought in Jeffrey Tubin, um, public masturbator, to give his thoughts on, um, on all of this because he's their legal analyst. And uh, here's what he had to say. You know, there is a lot of evidence. Uh, there are many societies, especially in Central and South America, that ban abortion altogether. And the rate of abortion does not go down when, when abortion is banned. There are just as many abortions, if not more, in societies where abortion is legal. What's different is that women die and women are horribly mutilated uh, because abortion is, is conducted in a uh, unsafe way. But the idea of a legal ban on abortion stopping abortion is a myth. Mm -hmm. It does not happen. All it does is drive the process underground and, and endanger women's lives. Now, Jeffrey Tubin is, you, you may think, uh, why are they bringing this guy on to talk about this issue? But he is really invested in the abortion issue because he cheated on his wife and um, conceived a child with his mistress and then paid to, for his mistress to, uh, to have an abortion, demanded that his mistress have an abortion. So he's very invested, and he's an expert in that way. You know, he, he, has a, he has some lived experience with this issue. And you're always going to find that with the men who feel the strongest about keeping abortion legal. It's because they've got very self-serving reasons for that. As I've tried to explain before, this is one thing that women should understand. I think, uh, I think every pro-life woman does, but pro-abortion women don't. And that is that the men who are your, quote, allies— it's only because they want to use you. Well, there are two reasons. Uh, one is it's a virtue signal on their part. And, but, but I think at a deeper level, it's because they want to use you like an object. They want to be able to use you sexually and then just throw you aside and not have any consequences, not have any responsibilities or obligations that come with that. That's what that's about. That's why they're your ally. Because you are a sexual object. You are nothing but a glorified masturbatory aid to them. And uh, that's how they want to use you. And they are more than willing, if it means that they can uh, use you for their own se sexual gratification, um, if that means that killing a child, they're perfectly fine with that. So those are your allies, ladies. And you notice, uh, as to the substance of his argument, such as it is, he says two things. We're going to hear a lot of this. We already have. Uh, one is that if you get rid of abortion, which again, overturning Roe v. Wade does not get rid of abortion, but if you do, then um, it's going to make abortion unsafe for women. And also, getting rid of abortion will not drive the rate of abortion down. So we heard both of those things. As for the unsafe part of this, well, first of all, there's no such thing as a safe abortion because in every abortion, at least one person is killed. Uh, unless the baby survives the abortion and then, is, and then is killed outside of the womb or left to die in the corner of a room somewhere, as often happens, as has happened in D.C. recently. Um, so that's, that's what abortion is. It is, by its nature, inherently unsafe. It's also unsafe for women, inherently, by its nature. It is physical destruction. It is, uh, in, in a culture where we call everything violence... Abortion is violence, and it's a violent act, a violent, lethal act being carried out within your body. And that is, by its nature, unsafe physically. Never mind psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually, where it's totally devastating. But as to the, the physical part of it, um, is, is it true that... Um, it's probably physically, quote, safer for a woman to get an abortion at a clinic as opposed to in a back alley somewhere. 
even though the, the back alley hysteria, back alley abortion hysteria is mostly, mostly based, based on myths and everything else, but is it, is it true that it's most of the time going to be, quote, physically safer for the woman to get the abortion in a, in a clinic as opposed to the mythical back alley? Well, yeah, of course. But a, a sane and civilized and moral society, which is grounded in law, should not provide safe spaces to kill children. So if going into a back alley to get an abortion means that it's, it turns into this dark and dirty and disgusting thing, well, yeah, because that's what it is. And we shouldn't be doing anything to sanitize it or make it safer. Any more than we should be providing an environment uh, for mothers to bring their two-year-olds and have them euthanized. As far as this claim that, it, that outlawing abortion doesn't drive the rate of abortion down, um, I would not take that claim on face value from Jeffrey Tubin in the first place. But even just pretending that it's true, which it isn't, but pretending for a second for the sake of argument that it's true, that you outlaw abortion and it doesn't drive the rate of abortion down. Like, of course it does. But just again, for the sake of argument, let's pretend that that's true. Well, it's basically irrelevant. I mean, murder in all forms, outside of the womb anyway, murder in every other form is illegal. And yet it still happens. Like th the fact that it's illegal to just walk up to somebody and shoot them in the head, does that prevent people from doing it? Obviously not. Go to any major city in America and it happens all the time. So the simple fact that murder is illegal doesn't stop anyone. In fact, nobody is prevented from committing murder just because it's illegal. The laws against... Um, against murder have almost no direct preventative effect. Because you could still just walk up to somebody and kill them if you want. Same for the laws against rape. Same for the laws against everything. You can still do it, and all of these things still happen. I mean, human beings have been raping and killing each other since the dawn of human civilization, tragically. And that's always going to be the case. So does that mean that you just get rid of the laws against murder and rape because it's going to happen anyway? No, you still have the laws in place because, number one, again, if, you're, if you want to be a civilized, sane, just, moral society, then you cannot tolerate and accept actions like that, crimes like that. Um, also, you need to have something in place to punish people who commit these acts. And to segregate those who have shown a willingness to commit those acts from the rest of society to keep everybody safe. And there is certainly, we have to assume, some deterrent effect in having murder illegal. So the argument just doesn't make any sense. Whether it drives the rate of abortion down or not, uh, the fact is you, you, it, it must be illegal because it's the murder of a child. And that's it. That's why it should be illegal. All right. You know, the other great thing about this decision, the uh, draft decision anyway, is that it completely ruined the night for all of the libs at the Met Gala last night. Um, the Met Gala was, was happening with the theme Gilded Glamour. And uh, they all showed up on the red carpet. So I want to go through a little bit of a, you didn't expect you're going to get this today, but we're going to do a little bit of a fashion review. Let's just go through some of the looks. And first of all, May Mayor Eric Adams was there. And, uh, you know, he promised to put an end to the violent crime epidemic in the city. Lots of people were wondering uh, how he would do that. And last night, he finally unveiled his plan to get rid of uh, gun violence. And there it is there. He's wearing a suit that says, end gun violence. And just like that, the violent crime epidemic in New York City, and indeed across the entire country, was, was brought to an end because of Eric Adams. So that, I thought, was, was pretty courageous. Lots of other courageous. Let's just go through some of these. I don't even know what you're going to put up on the screen. Okay, so we got this person here. I don't know who that person, I don't know who any of these people are, but she's got that uh, little bit of, um, if you, I think it's a beautiful dress if you want to look like a diseased bird or maybe a pin cushion. 
It's a great look. Go to the next one. What else do we have here? Another one. So it's more of the diseased bird look. Okay, now this, this I like this right here because this is kind of that, um, if you're going for the Pepto-Bismol vibe, and that vibe is really in right now. So I don't know who that is, but his guy with the full pink suit, pink shoes and everything. That's a great look. I'm actually liking all these. Okay, this guy, that's just, if you want to look stupid, I guess you wear that. We can go to the next one. Okay, this one right here. That's the one. This is like if Edward Scissorhands had sex with a peacock and then the kid grew up and became addicted to meth and was a sex offender, that's what it would look like. All right, I think we saw enough there. And all of those people, oh, and then there's a, that's that one too there. That's kind of like if you, if you get a BDSM outfit at Party City, that's what you would, I think that's probably what that would look like. All those people, they got dressed up, they, got the, they spent thousands of dollars on their, on their nice outfits, and they went into the gala, the banquet, and it's right then that the news dropped that Roe v. Wade was, was, is going to be overturned. And I just, I love every part of that. Um, even if the news never should have been leaked in the first place. Okay, let's uh, move to this. MSNBC, uh, the anchor over on MSNBC worries that Nazis may be taking over because of uh, Elon Musk taking control of Twitter. I'm not sure I exactly see the connection, but let's listen to him make the case anyway. I mean, it's easy in American discourse to talk simplistically about the far left and the far right as two equally dangerous fringe blocks. Elon Musk has done it plenty of times just in the past week. But here's the difference. America's far left wants to give us free health care and free child care. America's far right wants to give us white supremacy and no democracy. And this asymmetrical polarization of U.S. politics would be laughable if it weren't so horrifying. We are living through an unspeakably dangerous moment. The pro-QAnon, pro-neo-Nazi faction of the Republican Party is poised to expand dramatically come the midterms. We're just two years away from Donald Trump very possibly re-seizing executive power. If that happens, we may look back on this past week as a pivotal moment when a petulant and not so bright billionaire casually bought one of the world's most influential messaging machines and just handed it to the far right. Uh, a not so bright billionaire, says the talking head on MSNBC. Not so bright. I mean, the guy is the richest man in the world and he builds rockets. <laughs> he's, uh, he's not. He just builds rockets and he's planning to go to Mars. Okay, Elon Musk is actually going to, it, it, to, to land crafts on Mars, but he's not so bright. He's certainly not as bright as a bloviating talking head on MSNBC. And uh, this guy, whoever he is, he says that uh, you know, the far left and the far right can't be compared. They're not equally as dangerous, and he's right about that part, but he's wrong about all the rest of it. All the far left wants to do is give you free health care. Yeah, that's all they want to do. Uh, what he forgets to mention is that the free health care that the far left wants to give includes um, dismembering babies in the womb and chemically castrating 12-year-old boys. That's the health care. So he forgot to leave. He left that part out. He forgot about that part. But otherwise, again, I totally agree with him that you can't compare the far right and the far left. This is something that Elon Musk does. You know, because Elon Musk himself, despite how he is portrayed, is not a member of the far right. I'm not sure you could really say he's a member of the right at all. Uh, I don't know that he would identify himself as a conservative, and I don't think I would identify him, him that way. But he said many times recently that he considers the far right and the far left to be a problem, and so he wants to handle Twitter in a way that, you know, if it, if it upsets the the most extreme 10% of, uh, on both ends of the spectrum, and that means you're doing your job. Um, and in spite of saying that, of course, the, the left is still freaking out about him because Musk is, look, is, is trying to find an avenue here of kind of neutrality, and the left does not want neutrality. They take it if you're with, a, you know, with us or against this approach. And they take that approach with everything. And they take it with uh, the issue of free speech as well. But Musk is wrong about that when he when he says, "Oh, they're they're equally as dangerous." Uh, no, they're not. 
because on the far left, again, you know, that's where you get the death cult. That's where you get people who um, are right now panicking over the thought that more babies will be born. That's what they're upset about. All right, one of the clip I want to play for you, Jen Psaki, yesterday at the White House press conference, was asked about the disinformation board, the Ministry of Truth, and here's her explanation of it. The mandate is not to adjudicate what is true or false online or, or otherwise. Um, at, it will operate in a nonpartisan and apolitical manner. It's basically meant to coordinate a lot of the ongoing work that is happening. And what their focus is, the focus is on disinformation and threats to the homeland, as I noted, which things like inciting things that would incite violent extremism, um, you know, human traffickers and other transnational criminal organizations, uh, any efforts at pol- uh, malign foreign influence, anything that would endanger individuals during emergencies. So a lot of this work is really about work that people may not see every day that's ongoing by the Department of Homeland Security. Mm-hmm. She says that it's nonpartisan, which is the same thing we heard from the DHS secretary yesterday in his interview on CNN, where he said that uh, the person who is Helming is going to be at the, the lead of the quote-unquote disinformation board is totally neutral. But once again, that we, we know that that is not true. There's no such thing as a neutral person, especially not on the left, but really not anywhere in, in human society, not anywhere in the human race. Nobody is actually neutral. Everybody has a worldview, a perspective, which is exactly why you cannot entrust human beings in the government with something like this. And you certainly, the claim that it's going to be nonpartisan, there is no nonpartisan part of the government. That may exist in theory. That may be an ideal that you strive towards, but that doesn't actually exist. Everybody in government, all of them, have um, political leanings, political uh, loyalties. All of them do. Which is why you cannot entrust them with something like this. Uh, one other thing here is from the Daily Wire. It says security guard Travis McGivern um, testified Monday that he had to rem- he had to remove Johnny Depp from a situation due to the actor's ex-wife Amber Heard physically assaulting him. Heard allegedly punched Depp in the face during the incident, threw a can of Red Bull at the actor, and tried to spit on him. Depp is suing the Aquaman actress for more than fifty million dollars over alleged defamation stemming from an op-ed Heard penned at the Washington Post, claiming to be a victim of domestic violence. Heard is countersued for more than hundred million dollars herself. Um, Givern testified, at some point I witnessed Miss Heard throw a Red Bull can that struck Mr. Depp in the back. At that point, I moved closer to Mr. Depp. I didn't want my client to get hit with anything else. Their verbal onslaught continued from both of them. Miss Heard threw something else, either a purse or a bag, and I was able to knock it away so it didn't hit Depp. At one point, she spit at him, and a lot of verbal vitriol from both of them. And then uh, he says that she, he had to get Johnny Depp out of the situation for his own safety. Now, this is the latest out of this trial, and um, here's my, my, my point about this. Now, I'm, it's good that it seems like most people who have followed the trial between Amber Heard and Johnny Depp um, are realizing that this is not the, the simple picture that Amber Heard and her advocates wanted to paint, where you know she's the, the victimized woman and he's the evil man and all that. I think most people are realizing that it's, it's more complicated than that. But then you have people that are going too far to the other end of the spectrum here and are coming fully to Johnny Depp's defense and they're fully on his side and Amber Heard is the, is the villain here. No, there are, I, and I say this as someone I admit, haven't, I haven't followed the case, the story that closely. But I just know because this is a general principle that is almost always true, not always, but almost always true. In a, you know, in a divorce situation, marriage falling apart, something like this, there is very rarely a clear good guy and a clear bad guy. You know, they, they both can recall situations where one person was the good guy and one, one person was the bad guy. But that's the thing. They both have evidence of that. They both have examples they can present. And then they're just throwing those examples back and forth. And sometimes they're throwing physical objects as well. Because in the vast majority of cases, um, it takes more than one person to make a marriage fall apart, which is why it's normally quite absurd to take sides, especially when it's celebrities, it's people you don't even know. Even when it's a, a couple that you do know, taking sides when the marriage is falling apart is usually a bad move. 
because it means you're getting you're getting the story from one person and they're just telling their side of it and they're not going to tell you all the terrible stuff that they've done. But when it's celebrities, like it's just it's guaranteed that they're both total scumbags. Johnny Depp has already been divorced multiple times and uh, and I do know this much about him. He left the mother of his children to go shack up with this Amber Heard character. And then uh, a year later, the marriage fell apart. Marriage barely lasted a year. So he, he left his family for this woman, and the marriage falls apart. So that already means he cannot be the, the flat-out good guy here, which doesn't make Amber Heard a good person. It just means they're both bad guys. Like It, it almost doesn't matter what happened in this particular marriage. You left your family for this woman. You abandoned your kids. So you're already the bad guy. There's no recovering that. So, and that just makes it a little bit simpler. Uh, they're both probably scumbags. And uh, also, by the way, Johnny Depp, if you're a conservative defending him, he almost certainly hates your guts and would never come to your defense if he, ever, if he, if he cared enough to say anything about you, which he wouldn't. So another thing to keep in mind. You know, using the internet without ExpressVPN, it's uh, kind of like taking a call on a train or a bus on speaker for everyone to hear. You don't know who has, ass- who, who has access to your most private, sensitive information, even though lots of people actually seem willing to do just that. We'll even use FaceTime in public, which I find incredibly annoying. Uh, so don't be that person. Here's why I use ExpressVPN. Internet service providers know every single website you visit. And in the U.S., they can legally sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who then use your data to target you. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so people can't peep on your online activity. Just fire up the app, click on the button. Uh, It's as simple as that. It works on phones, laptops, even routers, so everybody who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected. No wonder it's rated number one by Business Insider and The Verge. Secure your online activity today at expressvpn.com slash Walsh. Get an extra three months free of ExpressVPN That's expressvpn.com slash Walsh. Again, that's expressvpn.com slash Walsh. Let's get now to the comment section. Do you know their name? They're the sweet baby gang. Sharon says, uh, I'm so excited to have Johnny the Walrus from my preschool class. The kids love the book when I was reading it this morning. They immediately asked if I could read it again. Um, I love that. I'm hearing people read it to their preschool classes. People are, um, another great thing that you can do if you want to be very charitable is, you know, they have those, um, a lot of a lot of places will have those little free box libraries that, you know, on the sidewalk and you could just put a book in there, leave a book, take a book type of thing. Um, I'm hearing people leaving there, you know, donating boxes to schools and libraries. All of that is great and I appreciate it. And it's, again, charitable work as well. Um, let's see, Wayne talking about the Discovery Plus documentary about uh, called Generation Drag about cross-dressing kids and their abusive parents. Wayne says, in some cases, I can't fault the parent in the documentary. When I was a father in the late 80s and early 90s and the boys became teens, it was a constant battle of wills. We punished it. Uh, we punished, but still it didn't uh, stop their rebelliousness when they were out of sight. It's tough teaching your children the truth when they're bombarded daily by lies. Today, I think the pressure is far worse than back then. For some of those fathers in the video who don't agree, I doubt they'd say anything in the documentary. I could imagine what would happen if they did. The mothers or fathers that uh, would speak out wouldn't be on the show and probably be demonized. Well, Wayne, I appreciate your attempt to be charitable to these parents, but I think it's uh, vastly misguided in this case. You know, first of all, Saving your children from something like this is worth any cost you have to pay, including and especially being villainized by what the mass media, by the left, by the culture. Who cares about that? I mean, that's something, if you're going to be a parent at all, then you need to be willing to be villainized because that's the way the culture responds to good parenting these days. And it's been that way for a long time. So I'm not going to, I don't accept that excuse at all. And yeah, it is very difficult to be a parent. I know that. And I think that there are serious challenges that parents today face that parents in the past did not face. Now, there are serious challenges that parents in the past faced that that we don't, but there are just certain things we're dealing with right now. I mean, let's just take the the internet for one thing, social media, all that sort of thing. You know, if you uh, were a parent 
in the 90s or any time before that in human history, you didn't have to worry about this little um, contraption that your kid might carry around just totally overtaking their entire life. I mean, I guess back in the 90s, you had Game Boys or something like that, and maybe some kids played with those too, too much. But uh, just, just now having social media, the internet, there's like this whole other universe that exists out there where kids get sucked into it and it becomes their entire life, their entire identity. And uh, it's where they're exposed to the most hideous and graphic and perverse things imaginable. That's something that didn't exist in the past. It does now. So those are all the challenges, and I get that. But that's your calling. That's what you're called to. That's your vocation. Because you're a parent today. You're not a parent 30 years ago. You're a parent today. And so you just have to deal with that. And there is simply never a time when you can, as a parent, go along with your kid destroying themselves. Your kid uh, rejecting their own essential nature. Your boy rejecting his masculinity. Parading around on stage, cross-dressing. Being used as a pawn, being sexualized in that way. I mean, you can never accept that. You got to fight tooth and nail every day to save your child from that if that's what it takes. All right. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? Cool Papa J Magic says the Crusades were based. Matt, you should do a series about the Crusades and other history that's told in falsehoods by the regime. Um, yeah, the thing about the Crusades is that they happen over the course of centuries, and it's hard to speak in general terms about this entire period of history that that uh, ex- that that's spanned centuries. But one thing we can say about the Crusades, and they don't teach this in school because they don't teach much of anything worth knowing in school, uh, but the Crusades were launched as a defensive strike against what at that point was centuries of Muslim aggression. So that's the most important thing to know about the Crusades. And finally, Andrew says, Matt, why are you not promoting your movie, What is a Woman? Well, stay tuned. Very soon, I'll have a lot more. I, I just, I've, I've been, it's been like a gag order. There's so much I've, I've wanted to say about this film, and, but, but very soon, you're going to hear a lot more about it. And that's all I can say right now. Just stay tuned. When the world goes woke, the Daily Wire builds alternatives. That's why we started our own publishing wing called DW Books. And we're so proud to announce that one of our first books, Fiery But Mostly Peaceful, The 2020 Riots and the Gaslighting of America, is finally available for purchase today. The book is written by Julio Rosas, who exposes the Black Lives Matter riots that broke out across the country in the aftermath of George Floyd's death and exposes them for the sham that they all really were. Rosas, who was reporting from the ground, has as a firsthand experience that he illuminates the media's attempts to convince Americans that the fatal and destructive riots were uh, peaceful somehow. Here, check out the trailer. The media gaslit the American people for all of 2020 as the riots unfolded. They did not give you the full story. I was there. George Floyd, Kyle Rittenhouse, Ray Shard Books, Chaz in Seattle. I saw all the riots with my own eyes. Windshields being smashed, giant rocks that were being thrown. Businesses that were starting to be looted. The crowd started to become hostile. All the cops were trapped and surrounded. Police were being ordered to, to retreat. I experienced the, the tear gas, I experienced the smoke. This was very real to me. The mainstream media, they were trying to call them protests. CNN with that Chiron saying fiery but mostly peaceful. They're trying to push a narrative of don't believe your lying eyes because they were trying to appease that very dedicated Antifa movement that's there. When you read my book, Fiery But Mostly Peaceful, you will get the full story. You will learn what actually happened during the riots of 2020 and what the media did not want to tell you. Buy my book, Fiery But Mostly Peaceful, everywhere books are sold. The book is available right now for purchase on Amazon or anywhere you go buy books online. So order your copy today. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Now an epic story with a twist ending for our daily cancellation today. It begins with the Sydney Morning Herald and an article by a woman named Amanda Trenfield, which is actually an excerpt from a forthcoming book by the same author. Um, More on that book in just a moment. The title of the piece is Less Than a Month After I Met My Soulmate. I ended my 14-year marriage. Now, from here, we're told all about Amanda's first encounter with her soulmate and about the decision she made to leave her husband in pursuit of this other man. She reports, quote, I wasn't expecting a formal dinner with cheerful conference attendees in the beautiful West Australian town of Margaret River to turn my life upside down. I had a good life. I wasn't looking to upend it. Or was I? 
I decided only the week earlier to attend the three-day event with my husband. It wasn't in the family holiday plan, and we had to arrange care for the children, but I saw it as a perfect opportunity for us to reconnect as we had become quite distant. I believe that time away from the stress of everyday life was the perfect remedy to reignite our relationship. Now, it appears that she gave the um, reconnecting with my husband and reigniting our relationship idea about 30 minutes to pan out, and when it didn't, she immediately started ogling another man. She tells us about how she fell uh, madly in love with uh, a dude named Jason, who was sitting at the same table as her at this conference. And she says they talked all night. Um, She took sips from his glass of wine. He fed her dessert. And we're we're not told where the husband was during all of this. In fact, Amanda's husband is not mentioned hardly at all through the entire story. Her children also are not mentioned after the first paragraph. They're not even background characters in Amanda's love story. They don't exist, which tells you everything you need to know, really. Be that as it may, wherever her husband was during all of this, um, here's a tip that that hopefully most men don't need to hear. But if your wife is sitting with another man at a table, staring lovingly into his eyes, and eating pieces of chocolate cake off of his fork, you may want to have a chat with her, because you've probably got some serious problems. Now, later we're told that Amanda and Jason went to the hotel, hotel bar. Again, the husband is absent from the narrative. Again, I must remind any man listening that it's a very bad sign if your wife is sitting with any man except for you at a hotel bar. But Amanda tells us, quote, At the hotel bar, Jason bought me a glass of my favorite rosé. We looked into each other's eyes, his dark and mysterious, mine big and brown, and clinked glasses. The electricity between us was strong and raw. It traveled to my core. It was so intense I needed to break eye contact. The energy, it was electric. My body was completely charged. I was completely on. I loved talking with him. I felt warm, relaxed, and safe in his presence. I felt I could truly be myself at a level I wasn't familiar with. I realized that it was a a feeling I hadn't enjoyed in a long, long time, perhaps ever. The bar called last drinks, and the evening, now the early morning, came to an end. The goodbye was overt, open, and revealing of our mutual affection. We enjoyed a body-hugging embrace where I whispered into his ear, This isn't over. I need to see you again. He put his hands tightly on my waist and pulled me close. Yes, he replied. It was all I needed to hear. Um, And I I keep going back to the same question. Where's the husband? (laughs) She's locked in an embrace with a guy whispering in his ear. And her husband's just off in somewhere else. Well, it looks fine. Nothing to worry about there. Now, she says that this uh, experience flirting with Jason at the hotel bar profoundly changed her. As she puts it, I knew in my heart, in my soul, in the very fabric of my being, that I had profoundly changed. I couldn't articulate the feelings, the sensations, the experience. The connectedness I experienced with Jason was at a level impossible to describe. All I knew for certain was that this one encounter, in the most unlikely of places, under the most unusual of circumstances, had dramatically altered my life. Actually, there's nothing unusual about the circumstances. Um, I think people having affairs at hotel bars, pretty common. Uh, They left the conference and went home. Amanda had no more contact with the mysterious Jason, but a month later, she left her husband, ditched her kids, tore her family apart, ended her marriage, and set out to be with the true love of her life, her true soulmate, Jason. And you can find out much more about this story in her memoir, soon to be published, titled, When a Soulmate Says No. Because, as it turns out, her soulmate, Jason, rejected her. I mean, we can only imagine that uh, when the woman he flirted with for a few hours at a bar a month ago showed up at his doorstep and announced that she'd left her family for him, he was extremely creeped out. I'm not sure how he broke the news to her, but the end result is that Amanda was left alone, rejected, and humiliated. She had ruined her life for nothing. She was a failure, uh, an embarrassment, a woman whose unquenchable narcissism had destroyed her family, and now she has nothing to show for it. Where could she go from there? What could she do? Well, what else but become a life coach? Yes, Amanda Trenfield is now, according to her website, a transformational life coach. She's even certified in the field. She's a certified reinvention coach, she claims. Now, I have no idea how one obtains a certificate as a reinvention coach, but there's no question that Amanda is qualified. After all, she had a stable life and a a family and... and, um, And she reinvented it into a pile of rubble. Very similar to the way that I reinvented my parents' car when I was 19 by having a a head-on collision. 
You know, and nobody was injured in that case. In Amanda's case, entire lives were destroyed and devastated. And now she wants to coach you on how to do the same to your own life. Though that's not exactly how she puts it, of course. The description of her book tries to put a positive spin on all of this. Um, in the description, it says, Amanda never imagined that after uprooting her comfortable, stable life to make room for her soulmate, that he would decide to go his own way. They both agreed that their connection was unbelievably cosmic. So why did he say no? A fearless voyage of self-discovery fueled by stubbornness, tenacity, and an unquenchable thirst for answers to the great mysteries of the soul. Amanda shares the intimate details of her transformation from lovesick hot mess to self-actualized superstar with unapologetic vulnerability and effervescent humor. Through the exploration of grief, spirituality, energy therapies, self-acceptance, and the undeniable healing power of a good Diana Ross song, Amanda's story serves as an example of what is possible when we dare to dream of a life that's nothing short of miraculous. That is a very flowery way of putting I screwed my whole life up. And her, her story does indeed serve as an example. It shows the possibilities that open up when you shirk your responsibilities, reject your obligations to your family and to your spouse and to God, uh, break your promises, betray your vows, blow your whole life to pieces for the sake of fleeting emotional or sexual enjoyment. And really, all of those possibilities are just one possibility, which present themselves in vaguely different forms. The possibility is that you, which is really a certainty, is that you end up alone, pathetic, and miserable, and you spend the rest of your life trying to justify and rationalize the mistakes you made, and also attempting to recruit more people to join you in your misery and your failure. Many, many, many such cases. Amanda is but one. But there is another important lesson we can learn from Amanda, um, and that is that this is one of the, of the dangers of the soulmate trope. Of course, the real cause of Amanda's troubles is not any misunderstanding about souls or mates, but you know, it's really her own catastrophic narcissism, cowardice, and weakness. But even so, it's important to note that the, the soulmate, as the concept is presented in old Disney films and uh, Nicholas Sparks novels and so on, is a myth. There is not one single person who you are destined to be with. Your romantic match is not written in the stars somewhere. And the problem with seeing things this way is that if there's just one person in the world made for you, then it's possible, even likely, if you just do the numbers game, that whoever you marry is not that person. It's possible in this way of thinking to marry the wrong person. And it's also possible that you'll meet the right person after having already married the wrong one. Well, I'm sorry, honey. I, I thought our marriage was written in the stars. Turns out I misread the stars. It was actually supposed to be my secretary. So see you later. Again, many such cases. So am I saying that my own wife is not my soulmate. No, I am not saying that. She is my soulmate because we chose each other and stood at the altar and got married. Now we are bonded together for life in a deep and mysterious and spiritual way. Now we are souls forged together as one. Now we are soulmates. And I think this is actually quite a bit more romantic because it, it makes us active participants in our own love stories. We weren't drawn together by destiny. We chose each other by our own free will, and we bestowed the sacrament of marriage onto each other, which is how marriage works. So my wife didn't marry me because I was her soulmate. I'm her soulmate because she married me. That's the truth, and it's so much better, really, than the half-baked nonsense you get from Amanda and the life coaching community. But if you don't believe me and you want to hear more from Amanda and hear her side of this, um, you can always uh, have a one-hour consultation with her. I went to her website and checked it out. Um, it'll cost you just about $400 an hour. And the good news is that I looked, and she has wide open availability every day of every hour this month. It looks like her life coaching career is working out about as well as her marriage. And it also looks like there's nothing left to say about Amanda or to her, except you're canceled. And we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, production manager Pavel Vodowski. Our associate producer is McKenna Waters. The show is edited by Robbie Dantzler. Our audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. And hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2022. Today on The Ben Shapiro Show, someone leaks a draft of the Supreme Court decision on Roe versus Wade, and apparently a majority is now ready to end the non-existent constitutional right to abortion. And, of course, the left goes absolutely, completely insane and berserk. That's today on The Ben Shapiro Show. Give it a listen. Listen.